Thank you for downloading this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. This is the podcast where we explore Central Florida's history through the artifacts found in local area museums and historical societies. This series is brought to you by Riches, the regional initiative to collect the histories, experiences, and stories of Central Florida, and the Orange County Regional History Center. I am Chip Ford, and I will be your host for today's episode titled, Tobacco Pipes. Although state laws regulating tobacco use in public are common today, in the past, their use was a very public activity, one could say even a rather common ritual. Today, a majority of tobacco is consumed through cigarettes, which were popularized in the late 19th century because of new developments in the mass production of tobacco products. However, before cigarettes became uniform and mass-produced, pipes were the most common way to smoke tobacco. It might be hard to imagine, but the use of tobacco was not always a common or everyday practice. Pre-Columbian Indians throughout the Americas used tobacco mostly for religious and sacred purposes. Dr. Gerald Milanich, emeritus professor at the University of Florida, tells us about early tobacco practices with the native peoples of Florida. Samuqua Indians uh, gardened, I would say. They weren't extensive farmers, but they grew some corn and they grew squashes and they probably had beans and they also grew a kind of tobacco uh, much, much stronger than we use today and used it largely for ritual purposes. They probably put it onto fires and then inhaled the smoke. They used it in curing ceremonies um, and actually didn't, you know, smoke it like we think of smoking in pipes or cigarettes or cigars. They used it as a sacred herb and used it in ceremonies. And, and often people, if you inhaled powerful smoke from this powerful tobacco, you and other things they may have put in it, it may have been had a hallucinogenic effect and Throughout the world, shaman uh, religious practitioners and societies often use such herbs or you know hallucinogens to help them uh, transport themselves from everyday life to the life of the spirits where they can see visions and so forth to communicate with the spirits in the other world and so tobacco and perhaps smoking or at least inhaling tobacco smoke among the Tamuqua. Um, was not like darting outside of your classroom to smoke a cigarette. It was used for religious purposes. Since pre-Columbian Indians first cultivated tobacco, they also created the first pipes made out of stone and clay. Dr. Neil Wallace tells us about these early Indian pipes. Tobacco and pipes were made as early as several thousand years ago in the eastern woodlands of North America, including in, in Florida. And we find ceramic pipes and also stone pipes as early as about 2,500 years ago in eastern Florida. And they show up in, in burial mound contexts. And um, tobacco smoking was, uh, was definitely a, a ceremonial endeavor. There's reasons that they show up in burial mounds. The practice of smoking was ceremonial and also a lot of these objects, especially the stone pipes that were made from uh, stone sometimes as far away as the Midwest of North America, those had value. Those had ceremonial and prestige value. And so a lot of objects like that end up in burial mounds. After European contact and colonization, tobacco use would not be an activity for the exclusive use of Indians in North and South America. Indian societies created the basic pipe design, that of a tube and a curved hollow stem. After contact, however, European societies were interested in new tastes and new experiences, and the introduction of tobacco and pipe smoking became popular immediately. Frank Burla, a foremost antique pipe and tobacchiana collector, tells us about how tobacco pipes became part of an international trade network. Clay pipes came into what we call Western civilization through the various seafaring trading uh, countries such as uh, Spain, England, France, 
Portugal, etc. Uh, through through their seafaring trade, the pipes became <clears throat> uh, something that people finally learned about, and the clay pipes themselves uh, go back to the dates of Christopher Columbus. And at that point, they had uh, Native American Indians smoking, and they smoked handmade clay items. Uh, pipes were made out of whatever natural resource was available at that region. Clay and dirt <clears throat> were common. Then clay pipes developed in Western Europe in the early 1600s. The pipes on display at the Silver River Museum are known as trade pipes. Frank Burla explains these pipes and their place in a global exchange of goods. Clay pipes were used as a very important trade item worldwide. They wouldn't trade one. They'd have grosses. They'd bring in hundreds and thousands of pipes, and they would trade for spices or uh, rare plants or even some, maybe uh, some types of uh, rare stones. Uh, they were traded back and forth. Earlier, they were traded for food because in Jamestown, uh, they had a difficult time uh, developing the civilization. And the Indians knew the, the areas to fish and to hunt, and if you became friends with them, you would be able to, uh, to get your food and etc. as far as that goes. As Europeans and Americans took over the smoking of tobacco as a leisure time activity, these pipes took on a meaning ascribed to the owner of the pipe. Ornate or fancy pipes would communicate to an observer that the pipe owner had disposable income to spend on a fancy pipe. Frank Burla describes for us the evolution of pipe design. Originally, the first pipes were plain. They were mostly white or orange or brown in color. They were plain. Uh, everybody at first, when I say everybody, I'm talking in the 15 and 1600s, as soon as they can get their hands on it, they would they would smoke it. Then as the pipes became more available with different designs in that, the people who could afford to pay for the, the, the more designed work pipes would buy those. And that was a, a, a system of, of class. People would know what they would, would be smoking at that time. Most of the pipes featured in this episode are made from clay. Before the 19th century, clay pipes were handcrafted, but eventually, like many other products in the United States during that time, clay pipes were manufactured or mass-produced in large numbers. Frank Burla tells us how these clay pipes were initially created, and then how later they were manufactured en masse through a factory system. Originally, in the uh, 14 and 1500s, they were handmade with, with, with clay. Then they developed plaster of Paris uh, molds, then they developed press molds, then they developed metal molds. The pipe itself in the earlier days was a piece of clay where they would stick a piece of wax or something in it to open the air hole so you could smoke. You know, as you put the tobacco down, you have to have an air hole there. Uh, they would put something in there. When the tobacco or when the clay pipe dried, they would remove whatever was there, and then they had the air hole open. Then, as I said, they went to various molds. Uh, it became an, a, a big industry. I mean, there were millions of these things made. You have the molds, and then they were dried, and then they were sold in, in, in bundles. But most of them went through the seafaring countries, and that's where it became acclimation. And then later it became assimilation because everybody became accustomed to smoking pipes. Throughout the 19th century, clay pipes became mass-produced and more common everyday objects to Americans. With it, the meaning of the pipe could transmit more information than just class status. We see on the pipes featured at the Silver River Museum faces of general characters. We see here the face of a North American Indian, which were common depictions on clay pipes of the 18th and 19th centuries. This face is probably that of a sailor, meant to transmit a connection to people who worked in the maritime industry and were the most loyal consumers of tobacco during that time. Some faces were of famous people, mostly political figures. This pipe 
is a depiction of Queen Victoria of England. You will notice the face of a woman, a pearl, or jeweled, or maybe even a bead necklace. And on top of her head, you will notice a laurel wreath, denoting a symbol of achievement from European classical civilization. Pipes like these were originally made in Germany and marketed throughout the United States in the mid-19th century. Their popularity was so great that soon American manufacturers produced these same pipes, although with less detail, and lacking a glazed finish as compared to their European originals. These styles of pipes, that focused on the bust of an individual, were referred to as philosopher pipes. They got this name because they were meant to copy the famous busts of classical Greek philosophers that were found in museums throughout Europe. German, and later U.S. manufacturers, created a whole line of presidential philosopher pipes to commemorate a past administration, or promote a candidate running for office, much like a campaign sticker or poster might do in modern elections. Here we have one of the most popular philosopher pipes of the 1850s and 60s, that of George Washington. You will notice that instead of a laurel wreath on his head, he has a triangular crown, denoting a reverence for his time as first president of the United States. Here is a pipe denoting Franklin Pierce, probably produced when he was campaigning for the presidency in 1852, or soon after he won the election. You will see his name is written as Frank Pierce on the side of the shank of the pipe, probably communicating he was at ease with the common man. Finally, one of the most important pipes of this style was the Ulysses S. Grant pipe. Notice, he too is depicted in a philosopher style. However, since the pipes with his likeness were so common in the late 19th century, modern researchers began to refer to the American version of philosopher style pipes as U.S. Grant pipes, even if President Grant was not the figure depicted. The evolution of the clay tobacco pipe in North America follows not only the emergence of industrial capitalism, but also the rise of mass markets and mass consumerism. As the clay pipe became an everyday object, it transformed from a utilitarian instrument, used in sacred practices by the Indians, to an item that was decorative and could even transmit not only class distinctions, but political speech, such as, vote for Franklin Pierce or U.S. Grant for president. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of A History of Central Florida podcast. For more information about the items featured in this episode, visit the Silver River Museum and Environmental Education Center at 1445 Northeast 58th Avenue, Ocala, Florida, 34470. Make sure to join us for our next episode titled The Spalding Plate.